My name is Pauline Borsa. Since the time I was able to travel independently in my teens, I've always sought out farmer's markets wherever I've gone. I'll never forget the taste of an apple I bought at a farmer's market in rural Brittany in the early 1970s. I also patronized farmer's markets wherever I've lived away from my beloved native California. I so respect the work farmers do and trust they know how to best manage their soils and plants. I'm also friends with Guillermo Cayet, the Santa Cruz entrepreneur who started Local Harvest, the premier national website for family farms and local agriculture. At one point 10 years ago, when the website was first being launched, I even wrote many of the product descriptions of the fruits and vegetables that are listed there. I know that CDFA has been very concerned about what impact LM might have on the farms, fields, and open spaces of California. But the sellers I've talked with at the farmers markets I've been patronizing in Santa Cruz over the last several years haven't told me of any problems with LM, but have told me about the problems caused by LM quarantines. Four years have passed since retired UC Berkeley entomologist Jerry Powell first spotted what he thought might be an LM in his Berkeley backyard. By now, almost half a decade later, I think we would all know if Elbam, a bug originally from Tasmania, it's not even native to Australia, were going to defoliate California trees and plants. But by 2010, we here in California really don't have to worry that Elbam will somehow behave much differently than it has in New Zealand, where it's been naturalized for almost 150 years. New Zealand has a climate and terrain very similar to California's and grows many things, such as Chardonnay grapes and Monterey pines, which we think of as being distinctively and important in California. In the places where Elbam likes to live, it's about as common in New Zealand as it is in California. Elbam's meek and mild behavior in California has demonstrated that we can really look to models such as New Zealand's Bald Hills Vineyard, whose award-winning Pinot Noir is created from grapes grown intercropped with flowering buckwheat, phacelia, and mustard. These plants host parasitic wasps which feed on Elbam, so the moth remains no problem at all for the sustainable vineyard. We can also believe that Dr. Michael Butcher technical manager of Pip Fruit New Zealand, has told us, Pip Fruit New Zealand is the business association of apple and pear growers in New Zealand. And what Dr. Butcher has said is that LBAM is what he calls background managed to very low natural levels, with a particular reliance on wasp. He says LBAM is not a major damaging pest of fruit crops, but is a major quarantine pest for export of fruit to the United States. So I think it's time to trust the wisdom of our farmers and trust what our colleagues in New Zealand have told us. Let's let our farmers get on with their vitally important work and not bother them with the LBAM program. I feel we should end the LBAM program altogether because it doesn't seem to benefit anyone. Thank you. Senator Warren, committee members. My name is David Dilworth. I'm here representing the Board of Trustees of Kalkanar Peninsula's Environment, or HOPE. So I get to accurately say I'm bringing you HOPE. We are the organization that filed the CEQA lawsuit that was later copied by the City and County of Santa Cruz, which ultimately proved successful and enforced the environmental impact report. And I not only appreciated your questions, but the, uh, the thing that you brought out that I thought was so important was that the EIR worked. It did. It changed the goals. It changed the methods. The EIR system worked. The problem was CDFA didn't want to follow the law. They had to be forced into it. I have some recommendations for you a little bit later on. But the, um, the aerial spraying actually appears to be, have been counterproductive. As they, they point out, the trapping is what they're basing everything on. And the numbers went up after they sprayed. It doesn't seem like that actually had the effect that they were intending. And what we've heard here today, it appears that the spraying was more harmful than the moth was. The moth hasn't done any damage. We're still at zero damage to the crops in California and our environment. But the CDFA's response to it, the quarantine and so forth, has cost tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, it's our opinion that LBAM is a solution in search of a problem. There's been no damage, and so there is no need for this project. What has happened since September, August, September 2007, is that there's been a movement that you have a room full of highly informed people. They now know the science, they now know the law, and this is just a representative sample of thousands of people throughout the Central Coast 
who are here to support you for doing something that fundamentally changes the way that business has been done in the past. As Professor Carey pointed out, it needs a top to bottom overhaul. You have a lot of support from highly informed people. CDFA has been exhibiting, uh, I'm gonna call it a bunker mentality. Hide, don't answer questions, provide fish stories, bad science. Actually, bad science I think would be too charitable. It's, I would call it pseudoscience. I write about the difference between science and pseudoscience. And pseudoscience is when you make things up that do not have a clear, unambiguous hypothesis. CDFA, it, uh, trying to nail them down on what they actually have in mind, is uh, I think you could call it accurately uh, moving the goalposts. Uh, we had the draft EIR, we had the final EIR, both of those said that they were going to be eradication was the goal. Then in the findings and the certification, they changed the goal. Courts do not often hold up problems with EIRs. It's a very difficult threshold to reach. But one thing they hold up is a stable project description. And they just change the fundamental description of the project that they have. In the Monterey Peninsula, we call this staffocracy. It's a goofy decisions and zero accountability. I want to bring one factual thing to your attention. If you notice very carefully, carefully, the general counsel for CDFA did not say that they would not be spraying aerially any toxins. Every time he used that sentence, he said, we will not be spraying, aerial spraying pheromones. That's, that's a pretty serious thing to us. Some of the suggestions, uh, we actually believe they may try to do things other than pheromones in the spraying. Um, here are some suggestions for, uh, that would make the process better in the future. First, there is only one place in California law where bureaucrats, staff, are required to answer questions. Only one law. Very few people know that, but that's in the process when you respond to an EIR. Nowhere else are bureaucrats required. They're not even required to answer questions. They're not even required to show up at your meetings. A law that requires them to answer questions would be a big step forward. Second, uh, there should be a penalty for fish stories. When they make things up, and it takes us two, three days, sometimes two, three months, to get the correct answer, and the burden is now on the public to find out what the correct answers are, and we find out it's we've been told something completely incorrect, they keep on going. Uh, we actually have an award that we're going to be presenting to, uh, this is the 2010 Whopper Award to OEHA Director Joan Denton, and that is for not correcting the record on this no link um, report. And you heard Mr. Levitt just uh, confirm that. He again said there was no link, but that's not what the report said, and that's not what OEHA now maintains but the public relations said that there was no link to any health effects. Levitt still thinks so, and that's what the EIR went through. Um, third thing is, we would like to suggest that you require the best available science. Inhalation tests, tests on lungs is still not available. And here is our last suggestion. If someone wants to do business in California, we believe they, when they file for a corporation, at the Secretary of State's office that they need to give up the right to have a trade secret when it involves inherently hazardous materials, things that can harm people. Tra trade secrets may be fine with Coca-Cola or anything else, but when you're going to be dealing with pesticides that have the opportunity to hurt people they're sprayed on or harm people who eat the food that they're used on, there should be no trade secrets. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Porter. My name is Mike, Mike Delay. I'm the State Farm Insurance Agent at Pacific Grove. Been there for 38 years. My wife and I are one of the 643 registered families that was harmed by the aerial spray. I endured the spray twice down here in Pacific Grove, thinking it was safe. I'm not here to so much speak on that because, well, one day my health has changed since that occurred, and we can't explain why or how. 
but it has and we still suffer and we still try to get back to normal health, which we've not been able to do. They talk about uncontrolled spray. I know those planes went over my house three times and they said we'd never see it. Well, following the next day, I had brown splats all over my cars and the house. And it stayed there for a long time. It was difficult to even wash off. That's not why I'm here. What we did was to try to deal with this issue, this threat that came to us that was going to force us to either move, close my business and move away when they threatened to come back once a month for nine months for the next three to five years, or stop them. We went out to try to stop them. The idea was, well, we coordinated and created the coalition of California cities to stop the spray, which resulted in a big effort from a lot of people, like David talked about, that were, like myself, forced to learn on an issue that I didn't care about, but yet threatened everything that I had in my health, in my community, and other people in my town. So we went out and sought resolutions to stop it, and then magically, miraculously, in three months, we had 30 cities writing resolutions in opposition to aerial spray and three county boards, which legally represent 2.447, well, 2,447,494 Californians represented by their local elected officials in opposition. But those resolutions, if you read them, are not only on aerial spraying. We pushed that issue because that was the major issue that we felt we could get attention on. But if you go back to those cities, and look at those county boards and look what they said. Aerial spraying was a major issue and an important one, but they were also concerned to the harm being proposed by other chemicals and other techniques that CDFA planned to use to bring pesticides, mind you, pesticides that are only designed for use in agricultural fields that are poisons and toxins and bring them into our homes and spray our families, our kids, our schools, our hospitals, just spray them everywhere and force us to live with this stuff for some un undetermined time. I mean, that, that itself is, is insane. And, and that's the, the point I say here is, why do we even talk about this? Where is it not even obviously wrong to bring something like that where we live and have to live with it day in and day out? I mean, I just don't understand that. And I know I see you today talking that same way. And I appreciate your questioning to the CDFA. But in working with the people in the cities and talking to people, that's their concern. Where, where are they taking pesticides and bringing it and making you have to live with it? I mean, that's just wrong to get the get-go. You know, you, I don't think you have to even argue that. Let alone my individual inalienable rights given to me by birth and sworn testimony and oath by you and everybody here in this, this assembly to protect me of my rights. And I can't declare my rights and say, stop this. This is obviously a violation of that right. But yet, they wouldn't. We asked them. They sprayed. And they're going to continue to come back and what? Put pesticides by, we don't know, trucks, twist ties, we don't know. What's the next species coming? What's that one going to be like? They didn't say they're not going to spray, well, they're going to give up the pheromones, but what about BTK? Or some other new, wonderful, miraculous pesticide they haven't yet revealed to dump on us to bring it into our towns? If I could ask anything, anything would be a bill to forbid that kind of activity bringing untested pesticides or chemicals and forcing people to live with them. How can we not change it for the chemical corporations to change it that they have to prove no harm? No harm to any product before they use it. That was probably a far reach, but that's what the people want. I think I covered all I wanted to say, and I really thank you for this, this chance and your efforts, especially, I really enjoyed what you did with the CDFA. I really like that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yes. Thank you. My name is Helen Gazoris, uh, coordinator for Stop the Spray Alameda County. I have come here today to voice my support for our farmers and growers. 
As a patron of farmers markets for decades, I especially appreciate food grown in ecologically sustainable ways without the use of pesticides. Over the past two years, I have heard many accounts of hardships experienced by our farmers under quarantine in CDFA, USDA's Alabama eradication program. None of the farmers I have spoken with consider Alabama to be a serious threat to their crops. However, they are threatened by CDFA, USDA tactics to enforce Alabama quarantines. Most are afraid to speak publicly for fear of retribution by these same agencies. I have heard that CDFA USDA eradication teams perform special LBAM inspections in agricultural fields. When a larva is suspected to be a light brown apple moth, it is sent to a laboratory for identification. Farmers are then notified by telephone with claims of positive LBAM identification but are not provided with any documented evidence to substantiate these claims. We know that for much of this time, positive LBAM identification of larvae has been inconclusive according to USDA documents. Farmers are forced to spray their crops with pesticides to eradicate LBAM. In some cases, farmers have no choice but to plow their fields under. When a harvest is destroyed, financial losses are incurred, which drives smaller farmers out of business. Moreover, forced applications of pesticides are particularly problematic for farmers whose commitment to chemical-free agriculture is often more stringent than USDA's own organic standards. Since the inception of the LBAM program, berries sold at the farmers' markets are more noticeably bruised Berries are damaged by overhandling during frequent inspections for LBAM. During inspections, growers cannot operate their farms, which results in more economic loss. Increased paperwork places an additional burden on farmers, especially for smaller family-operated <coughs> farms that cannot afford to hire more workers. Almost three years have passed since CDFA first declared LBAM an emergency. Yet there is still no documented LBAM crop damage. CDFA dubbed LBAM the light brown everything moth, an insect purported to destroy crops if left unchecked, resulting in multi-billion dollar losses to the agriculture industry. In reality, unnecessary CDFA USDA quarantines have hurt our farmers and growers all for an insect that has proven to be of minor concern in the field. Thank you. Senator Flores, thanks for having me today. My name is Glenn Chase. I'm a professor of management systems. And before I get into my specific uh, testimony, I'd like to turn toward the audience and recognize who exactly has come here from the public as a comparison to, to who's come here from the CDFA, not just today, but for uh, some time. I've been in meetings and hearings since 2007, and I have yet to hear a single scientist that is supporting the position of CDFA. I've only heard management people that continue to say, we rely on experts, yet they've never named those experts to my knowledge, and I've never heard from a single one. But I'd like to turn and just look to the audience to acknowledge who's here. I see uh, David Dilworth, who is a uh, head of an agency that uh, brought suit against the CDFA and forced an EIR in this matter. I see uh, Frank Egger, who brought suit against the EPA, and based on that suit, the Checkmate uh, pesticide has since been disallowed across the United States in the manner that it was used on the people of Santa Cruz and Monterey County. I see Dan Harder, the former director the Arboretum in UCSC, a person that, in my opinion, is, is the, the most expert on LBAM's effect on plants, hands-on, because in the state, he has the most experience hands-on with what LBAM actually does to the biggest variety of plants in our state. 
and specifically those that have come from New Zealand and the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I see, I, I don't recall Gutierrez's name, but he's a hero of mine. I've been reading and studying and analyzing Gutierrez and Mill's report because they don't just make statements, assertions that it's going to do something. They actually scientifically modeled it, and their model is consistent worldwide with where the moth actually lives. They didn't just assert it and say it'll live here. They modeled it, and then they took the actual data and said, sure enough, we find it in New Zealand where exactly where our model would have anticipated. So the strength of their model is incredible. Um, James Carey, I, I couldn't possibly introduce him. He's an invasive uh, pest specialist worldwide, and he's here. Um, we've got uh, Roy Upton from a health organization who also was a co-author of the reclassification petition. So those are the um, scientists. Have I, excuse me if I've missed anyone. And then we've got incredibly well-informed people. And I want to show you that this is what's come forward from the public. And I really appreciate this and I respect this. And I want to have you think about putting this up against the scientists that you've heard from. And if they existed, they certainly would have lined them up as they certainly have with uh, the attorneys. Anyway, back, back to me. I'm a professor of management systems. My specialty is envir environmental economics. And I also uh, teach graduate level in statistics. So I have expertise in differentiating and recognizing situations that are probabilistic versus ones that are causation. Anyway, it's my opinion, given that I have, a, that I have so much experience in management systems, that I see this program as something the CDFA wants to do, totally unrelated to the light brown apple moth. So no matter what the changes are in circumstances, no matter how the objective changes, no matter what changes, the program goes forward regardless. And that's been the condition since we heard about this month in 2007. So I had a prepared uh, talk, but rather than that, I want to say that since 2007, when I first heard about this moth, um, there has been misinformation delivered by the secretary of the CDFA on, on TV news, by uh, the public relations director, Steve Lyle, in the papers, and more recently by John Connell, who is, they've since retired. Um, but as an example, a practical example, it may not be as clean and swift, but I want to talk about specific misinformation that's been delivered to you today in this room. Okay, crop damage. I've got the official uh, environmental impact report document here, and let's remember that the CDFA has reported crop damage since 2007 in community meetings, through the press, in their own press releases. Okay, and, and recently, if you've heard about berry damage, I'm going to read to you from the draft EIR. Remember, the draft is not an addition that got changed. The draft and the final EIR are what composes the PEIR, which is the Program Environmental Impact Report. Those two documents are it. The draft has most of the substance. The final has the comments to the public and the few changes that they, they may have made. On chapter 3, page 320, it says, quote, no direct crop damages have been experienced to date in areas subject to existing infestation. That contradicts, this is a July 31st, 2009 document. This document contradicts every claim uh, of damage CDFA. Since this document, CDFA has again claimed damage. And it goes through the press and it's repeated by in good people, innocent. And uh, as of yesterday, I contacted the, the two of the infested areas, San Francisco, no documenta documentation of uh, damage at the Ag Commissioner's office in San Francisco. Approximately eight days ago, no documentation of damage in the Santa Cruz office. And these are the places where the damage has been consistently claimed. Today you heard, since development of SIT, they can now do things. I want to bring to your attention that is misinformation. There has never been a single interference of mating of LBAM through SIT. SIT is still in the R&D stage. SIT is far from uh, uh, a stage that it can perform in this program. And if you were to talk to any of the distinguished scientists in the room, 
they would tell you approximately that LBAM is about the last candidate for SIT because of the nature of its biology. The, the, in, in very approximately, the, the um, condition of eradicating these, uh, irradiating these moths is making them almost dysfunctional, let alone the thought that they could challenge wild moths in mating. Expansion of LBAM was spoken today by uh, the CDFA. That is an absolute assertion. Uh, there is absolutely no proof, no documentation, no basis that LBAM has expanded. Have they caught more? Of course they are. And of course that's been because of the, could be, because of the variation in the traps and the location of those traps. So I want to make sure that we don't leave this room today thinking LBAM is expanding. That's absolutely unproven. Something about conviction of the CDFA. Eradication has been mandatory. It's essential we eradicate up till a few days ago. And for the timing, the draft ER said eradication is mandatory. The final EIR said eradication is our goal. And a few days ago, when the APHIS, which is the agency of the USDA that is driving this program, came out finally and said, eradication is no longer feasible, which James Carey has said, and these other scientists, three years ago. Um, so we heard today and here that, okay, so we're going to control and suppress, et cetera, et cetera. But I remember just days ago, the technical working group said, eradicate is essential. Um, we've gotten messages from people in the technical working group. They never said that that. They said something to the effect that under the conditions that if the, the moth was just at the shore right near the port and we could go and stop it right now, but conditions were never that when we found them. But notice that uh, CDFA gave up eradication without even a flinch. So think about their conviction for any of the things that they've told you in this chambers that's so important to move on immediately. We heard in this room today, uh, how did this thing spread? Um, Natural, they said, was slow. Well, that's, I would, I would, I would ask James Carey to, to add or correct me on this. That's exactly the way these moths move. Some of these moths are generally known to only move 100 feet in a lifetime. So they've delivered that science that, they, that we know. It's a move slowly. But then what have they said? Modern transportation is responsible for this whole expansion of, of taking over of California by Elbaum. That's not even a good science fiction movie. I mean, you think about it yourself. From uh, it, and first off, I don't know. I can, I couldn't say yes or no. It's an assertion that has no basis in science. They have no actual documentation of these moths being moved in trucks or trains or airplanes. Statutory versus substance. Every time we corner them on the science. They immediately move to the statutory regulations that they're doing this because USDA is asking. So they flip-flop back and forth. Oh, now it's USDA. Is it the science? Well, well, so we, you notice it goes back and forth. There was a comment today by John, the lawyer for CDFA. I believe I don't recall his last name. He said, the public is invited back into the EIR process. I submitted 96 pages of questions to the EIR to the draft EIR, and I can't recognize a single answer to one of my questions in the response to the EIR that, they inc that CDFA included in the final EIR. Almost all of my questions were grouped into a group question, and, um, and I just, I, I tried, I gave it my best effort. I couldn't pull the answer to my questions out of the group questions in the way they, they fabricated the answers. John also said an aerial spray of pheromone. I want to clarify that for this, this hearing room. The dictionary defines pheromone as a substance emitted by an insect. There is not a single drop, nor has there ever been a single drop, in any of the pesticides that CDFA used to spray, or that they intend to use on twist ties, or any other application. It is a synthesized chemical that is, has a similar attribute to attract moths. They choose to call it pheromone, and it's attached with a huge number of other chemicals that we don't know. And they call it, well, then they'll say, well, it's a synthesized pheromone. It, it is not. Pheromone is a, a chemical 
emitted by an insect, theirs is not, not a single drop. And by the way, in that aerial spray, we think, what's a big deal, synthetic or not? It, the, synth the synthetic chemical they use and call it pheromone is not sufficient to fool the moth. The amount that was, the concentration that was in the air in Santa Cruz was approximately one million times greater than people would ever come in contact that were in proximity to light brown apple moth. And thanks to Dennis Neff, another citizen who is a you know, PhD scientist in the Monterey area to go into CDFA records, finally pull that out and deliver that to a very small number of people because it's, it's hard to understand in the general media. Okay, there was a statement today here that uh, 500 million crops are at risk annually. Jerry Powell, a retired uh, UC Berkeley entomologist, first discovered the moth in his backyard in 2006, not in 2007, that CDFA continues to say. CDFA confirmed it in 2007. Now, think about this, about the probability and the statistics. Jerry is probably the only one in the state being a micro-moth specialist who lived in the Southern Hemisphere. I don't think back in 2006, another entomologist would have recognized the difference between an L-BAM and an orange tortrix, which most people still can't identify. But because he lived in the Southern Hemisphere, he suspected it. Did he find one? No. On two separate occasions, Jerry found one each in his backyard. So think about the probability. Did L-BAM arrive in 2006? The chances of that are the same, approximately, as an individual winning the main California lottery two times during the same year. So in other words, even within a few years of that, it would still be that approximate probability. So the reality is, statistically, if LBAM got here just 10 years ago, it would be an incredible coincidence, one in tens of tens of thousands. More realistically, it looks like 30, 40, 50 years statistically, and that coincides exactly with the statement that James Carey, with his expert opinion, says it looks like that approximately. And he's encouraged the CDFA to do some significant analysis, but of course they never did. They just criticized Jim for where's your paper, when he was trying to encourage them to get on, to get on the right foot on this. Oh, we, uh, today it was mentioned the ER was started uh, before the court case. You saw what conviction they had with that. They fought the judge not to do the EIR. So let's, let's put that on the record. It's, and by the way, it's the certification document that claims that they will do no aerial spray. The final EIR and the draft EIR, which is the full F, you know, the P program environmental impact report, PEIR, still contains aerial spray. So it's only in the last few days that they've actually dropped this since APHIS said it's, no, it's not feasible to eradicate. And I'm, almost, I'm almost there. Today it was referenced that OEHA, and if this is, if you could, is it possible to read the, what was said in the record for something that CDFA said, or is that too troublesome now? Could that be read here? Just so you know, I mean, the, the purpose of the hearing and public comment for the purpose of the hearing in general is to build a transcript, so go ahead. Well, and I say that in words, with what? affection. So go ahead. <laughs> and uh, I forget the fellow's name from CDFA. What's the fellow that was up here? Levitt. Yeah, Levitt. Levitt said something to the effect that we have found uh, either that there was no connection between the spray and illnesses reported or that the spray had not caused the illness. Can we, can we read that back to see what he actually said? Can, can we read that in the record? No. Okay, no, we're going to have it. I'll go, oh, okay. I'll go forward either way. Why don't you give us your interpretation okay. of it? Okay. Yeah, I will. Whether uh, he said um, it wasn't the cause or we have said it wasn't the cause or that there was no connection. I'd like to read what OEHA actually said. I've got the document here. March, okay. Quote, our review of the symptoms reports received following the aerial application was unable to conclusively determine whether or not there was a link between the spring and the symptoms reported.
Okay, there's also been previous statements of non-toxic of these substances. I'd like to read this to you. Another, this is from OEHA again, and also a joint report from DPR as well, Department of Pesticide Regulation. On page two of their October 31, 2007 report, I believe it was released to the public on uh, November 18th approximately. The lepidopteran pheromone, that they call pheromone, a category three toxin. And for the record, category one is the most uh, toxic toxin. Uh, that would be hazmat suit, you know, fall over and die without it. Uh, category four is the least, lowest category of toxicities. It's a level three toxin. They sprayed that on the people and children of Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And for clarification, when a woman or a parent, I think of, usually I think of the mother, so I say a woman, when they go talk about protecting their child and non-toxic substance, that is not a level four toxin. Non-toxic substances are outside the range of toxic substances one to four. Well outside. Okay, I've mentioned CDFA has always relied on experts that have never come forward or ever even been identified. They've been, we've requested them over three years now. And what I'll ask finally, and I asked from this committee uh, uh, earlier, uh, Senator, you said that uh, this committee has the jurisdiction over this agency and over this program. I sincerely ask, that you literally stop this program, you use any routine measures or extraordinary measures that you have to stop this program. We used to call it eradication program, now we call it, we call it differently. Um, I understand future policies is a great thing to focus on and hopefully in the future we will, but to protect the people of California and to set a precedent against this, against this inappropriate behavior, if nothing else, and to protect the people, stop this program. Program. Thank you very much. Thank you.